Man was killed in a single car accident. A toxicology report released a week ago tomorrow revealed that Chason's blood alcohol level was more than three times the legal limit. According to Deneen, Chason thought he could drive home. He was not the first and tragically will not be the last man or woman to feel so confident. But the circumstances surrounding Chason's death, a post-game end-of-season party at a fellow NHL player's house, are unusual. For the past seven months, ESPN has been asking, is alcohol a part of hockey's culture? Larry Beal reports. There, there are no scientific studies that have examined whether alcohol abuse is higher among hockey players than athletes in other sports or among people in any other segment of society. Players Ken Danico, Grant Myers, and Darren McCarty are admitted alcoholics who have undergone rehab. Chris Pronger has also admitted problems with alcohol. Whether it's after a game or whatever, you go out with uh, your, your fellow teammates and uh, you know have a couple beers and talk about the game and uh, how things went. It's it's just kind of a, a a way to bond with your fellow teammates. It was natural. I mean, it was normal. That's what you did. I mean, it was play hockey, uh, go out after the games, drink, uh, you know, stay out late, have have a good time. That's what it was about. For me, I would never drink by myself. I mean, it was always with one of the guys off the team I'd go with and, and have some drinks with. When you think hockey, you think uh, you think beer. Whether it's you know from growing up being a Canadian and, and uh, you know what's the thing that when you want to be a hockey player growing up, uh, you got Molson Hockey Night in, Can uh, in Canada every Saturday night. Now it's Labatt. It's in your head, and it's always been in your head. And it's just you know after the game you go have a couple beers, you know, relax, come down just the way of life. If you look at the general population, in the age group of our hockey players, they represent 30% of the population, but they represent 50% of the fatalities and 50% of the injuries in automobile accidents. You, you said you mean young men? Young men. They're, they're overrepresented. So I think part of what we're looking at is, is what happens in the general population today. And, and so I don't don't see it as something that's different for hockey or different for basketball. It's just, it's an age group problem. A problem that doctors Brian Shaw and David Lewis were hired by the NHL to help reform. The players, and I think the league as well, recognized that alcohol was the number one drug that we were going to have to deal with. Since 1996, the league's substance abuse policy has provided a paid leave for confidential evaluation, treatment, counseling, and monitoring. Later violations of the treatment plan do carry penalties. As a cultural thing, yes, beer is the problem in the National Hockey League. The National Hockey League has always felt that, hey, beer is, beer is our problem. There was no league treatment plan in the 1970s when Derek Sanderson was winning Stanley Cups with the Boston Bruins and then blowing millions on drugs, alcohol, and bad investments. Everybody around me was drinking. We were all drinking. And that was the culture. That's what you did. You practiced from 10.30 till noon. You went to lunch. You had a few at lunch. And by that time, lunch got later in the afternoon and happy hour pretty soon. So you stayed from 4 to 6. And then you say, well, i got to have dinner. i got to get something to eat. Gotta, I'm drunk. i got to eat something. So you would eat, and then you'd have a bottle of wine at dinner. And then you'd go into the high octane. You'd be drinking till 2 in the morning. November 1985. The hockey culture of beer in the locker room, beer on the team bus, was shocked into self-examination by the post-game drunk driving death of Pelly Lindbergh, a popular and talented goalie for the Philadelphia Flyers. I'll remember it like it was yesterday. Impacted not only maybe for liability reasons or whatever, but the players uh, looked at it completely differently too. But I just don't see um, you know, the need for it in the dressing room. Players dehydrated. And we're, we're so conscious of you know, nutrition for our young players and uh, replacing fluids that the results, it changes. It's not to say guys don't go home or go to a restaurant and have a couple of beers. That's their choices. But we try and stay on top of it in, uh, in hockey functions, hockey environment. In 1986, Sanderson, sober and broadcasting Bruins games, began to notice a change. When I first started on the plane, on the charters with them, there was beer and, you know, you'd relax and after a game and the beer had gone early. There no, the Bruins never put a lot on, but it was all gone. And then about the fourth year there, the players started to become very young and the water and the juice came on and the beer lessened and then the water and juice and milk and then no beer and at the end nobody was drinking on the planes. The older guys retired and, and, and nobody drank. I think that if you look at hockey players today, they are not a bunch of drunks. They're, they're a bunch of guys who are professional athletes and they work hard at being professionals. 
And despite their personal struggles with alcohol, players we talked to neither blamed the game nor thought it had a uniquely severe problem. I don't think it's fair. I mean, I think that, that we're pinpointed. People want to portray it as everybody's at the bar hammered and they're, they're getting crazy. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it kind of gets you to the point where you get a little mad at uh, the stereotypes and you wonder why, why is everybody focusing on uh, alcohol and, and hockey players when uh, everybody in society is doing exactly what we're doing. It enabled me to, to drink the way I did, but it was my choice too, though. I mean, I'm not blaming, I'm not saying, oh, because I play hockey, I'm an alcoholic. I mean, I'm an alcoholic whether I drink or not. You know what I mean? Um, it just gave me the, the forum to, to do it. I look nowadays, it's changed a lot, I think. I mean, obviously, yeah, there's still, you know, drinking that goes on, but uh, it seems the young kids coming in today are much more aware and, and the conditioning's more important. Maybe they've become more businessmen now. They say, this is how I make my living. Am I going to damage that? Um, so whatever it is that's happening, there is a change. There's definitely a change. Can we do better? Absolutely. But that's where it is today. Larry Beal, thank you. ESPN's lead game analyst and NHL veteran Bill Clement joins us once again to discuss this difficult issue. Bill, I'll put it right to you. Is there an alcohol abuse problem in the NHL, and is it any different than any other segment of society? Well, Jack, there is alcohol abuse in the NHL. Uh, I don't think it's uh, any greater than uh, any other segment of society, and therefore, I don't think it's fair to say that there's an alcohol abuse problem in the NHL. There is a societal alcohol abuse problem. I sit on airplanes. I did just the other day, and I'm sitting beside executives, and this is 7 a.m., and they're, they're drinking, you know, Bloody Marys. They're drinking vodka. I mean, they're in any walk of life when there are, are stress positions that people find themselves in, somehow alcohol creeps in. But... There is alcohol abuse in the NHL any greater than any other segment of society? I say no. Just to be a player in the National Hockey League, you kind of have to have the attitude that you're the toughest nut in the toolbox. I mean, this is a game in which it's commonplace to see guys get stitched up on the bench, come back from grievous injuries in a game or two, sometimes not even miss a shift. Is that mentality one that could feed in the wrong direction to a guy who might be exposed to alcohol? I think so. I think that's a good point. I, I've always felt that, that it's not the consumption of alcohol as much as it is the combination of the mentality that, that pro hockey players have and other, other athletes that have to play really macho sports when you combine that mentality with alcohol because the mentality is one of, it's almost an in, invincibility syndrome. I mean, I, I, I played when I played, I was like all of the other guys. We thought we were bulletproof. You know, we can do anything. We've got this big S on our shirts uh, underneath our, our uniforms. and. That simply is not the case. So a lot of times athletes that play macho sports, uh, they, they think they can consume uh, incredible amounts of alcohol, then get behind the wheel of a car and drive that car. And that's just not something that's reality. But I think the combination of the macho mentality and alcohol, when combined, can be a problem. Well, this, in one thing about alcohol, affects everybody the same way. It it slows, down, uh, it slows down metabolism, it uh, shortens lives, it shortens careers, but athletes seem to be getting a little bit more in tune with having to take care of their bodies. When did that change? Well, I think it started to change when the salaries uh, started to, to escalate. And I will also tell you that today's NHL, there is far less consumption, at least to my eyes, far less consumption of alcohol uh, than there was when I played. I mean, we all drank, and we all drank to, us, to excess and we all did that regularly. It's a wonder uh, the vast majority of guys that played when I played are not alcoholics today. But, uh, but I think the change started when the salary started to escalate and athletes were told at a very young age, listen, if you can lengthen your career by two, three or four years, it could mean two, four, six million dollars. So the element of nutrition and what is good and bad for your body, obviously alcohol plays into that, uh, became part of this new mentality and I think it continues to improve. Athletes are in far better physical condition and are far more disciplined with what they're putting inside their bodies now than they were before and I think that the, the salaries started it all with the escalation of the salaries. Bill Clement, for your perspective, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Ahead on